Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been looking for something or you've been somewhere and you, and, and you found a hidden gem? You know what I'm talking about, the hidden gem? Like, you, know, you just found something, you're like, oh, I had no idea this was here. And you get super pumped up. Has anybody done that? You know, you know, maybe you're at a house and you're looking through a drawer for something else and you find something else and you're like, oh, looky here. Right? Right? Anybody with me? This happened on Friday night. We had some friends invite us to the TCA Christian Academy fundraiser here in Sykeson, and they had a silent auction going on. And I was walking around looking at all these beautiful things, and, you know, they had a motorcycle, and they had different stuff, you know, whatever. And I was actually, to my surprise, I found a hidden gem that no one was bidding on. And guess who got it? He's got two thumbs, and his name's Justin. It's just... <laughs> It was this guy. I walked by, I saw it, and then my wife bid on it, and then we got it. I thought for sure when she bid on it, there's no way I'm going to get it. And we got it. It was a $20 Jay's gift card. <laughs> I found the hidden gem. People didn't, people didn't even see it. They walked right past it, you know. You've got to keep your eyes open, people. You'll miss a hidden gem like that. And I, I feel like this story we're going to read from, I'm going to read this story to you today. We're going to dissect this story. I'm going to exegete this story. Um, it's one of those in the Bible. It's a hidden gem. So if you've never read this story before today, please get your Bible out, get your Bible app, whatever you got to do, and highlight this and go back. There's so much richness in this story. I don't want you to miss it. When we're talking about pursuing the heart of God. Now, let me give you a little historical background. I kind of stop. I'm going to kind of catch you up to where we're at in this particular story because we're talking about David. Now, you guys remember, uh, I just said it in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. David was anointed, not yet appointed. Chapter 17, he fights a guy by the name of Goliath. Well, he doesn't really fight him. He just kills him, right? He just boom, boom, right? You all remember that? 18, so you go up another chapter. Now Saul is jealous King Saul, who's the king at the point, he's, he's very jealous of David because everybody's like, oh, you know, Saul killed a thousand, but David kills ten thousands. Like, he's like, hey, wait a minute. I'm the king. He's not the king. What are y'all talking about that? So he gets jealous. And then also in 18, we find that his son Jonathan, so Saul's son Jonathan and David become friends in that. Then we go to chapter 19 of 1 Samuel. Now Saul's really angry. He's trying to kill David. And you'll notice in 19, he's trying to persecute him, trying to stop him, trying to kill him. It's, it's not good for David when you go to chapter 19. Chapter 20 in 1 Samuel, David asked Jonathan, why is your dad tripping? He's like, bro. I have done nothing but support your dad. I've fought for him. I've, I, I, have, I have that opportunity to kill him, and I didn't. Like, what's his problem? And Jonathan's like, yeah, I know. He's kind of cray-cray. But listen, here's the deal. Um, there's a dinner going to happen, and you best not come because he's going to kill you. Okay, so don't come. All right? So they get a plan together. And in the middle of this plan, if you read too fast, you'll miss it in this plan. There's a promise that is made. David makes a promise to Jonathan, 1 Samuel 13, 14, and 15. This is actually Jonathan talking. He says, but if he, talking about his dad, is angry and wants to kill you, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. And may you treat me with faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. Here we go. But if I die, here's the promise. Treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So there's a promise to Jonathan's family. He's saying, David, you promised me, even if I die, you will be merciful to my family, people that are in my family after me. So fast forward a few years. David has avoided having to fight uh, Saul many times. And then Saul and Jonathan end up passing away in battle. They die in battle. We got, now we fast forward into 2 Samuel. I'm, I'm speeding you up a little bit. David is now the king. Not only is he king, he's very successful at this point in the story. He's very powerful. The, the nation is very prosperous. He is very popular. 
So things are going really, really well for King David at this point. Now, he's strolling around in the palace, just like you know you do at your house. He's just strolling around like I know a lot of you do, right? Yeah. And a question pops in his mind. He remembers something. He remembers a promise, and then it prompts him to ask a question. And we see this question in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now, let me break down this question very slowly for you because it's very important to understand this question. Here's the first part of the question. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? Now, this was a good part of the question because if you're the king, it might be a good idea for you to know if there's anybody still alive from your predecessor, right? Anybody that's in that family. Why? Because there, it could be somebody that's alive from your predecessor that says, you killed my dad, we must overthrow him, right? So it was, it was very normal uh, for for the incoming king to completely wipe out the entire family of someone who was the predecessor, right? So it's a common, it's a common question. Now, this would be really a, a, a normal question, this part, if he just stopped here. He didn't, but let's just say he stopped there because there was bad blood between Saul and David because Saul tried to kill David over and over and over again. So if someone just heard that part of the question, they'd go, oh, well, that would make sense, David, because Saul hated you and was trying to kill you, so we should make sure there's nobody still alive. You should take care of this because, you know, uh, more money, more problems. Like, we, we, we got to get rid of this situation, you know. And if a king is asking, is there anyone still alive from my predecessor's family? What he's typically wanting is revenge. But then the question didn't stop there. He says this, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Now pause again. I'm not going to go. I'm gonna, here's more. He says more. But anybody left that I can show kindness? Now that particular word, I want you to understand that Hebrew word um, in our English word, it doesn't translate very well to English. And sometimes that happens from the Hebrew. Our English words don't have as much weight sometimes as the Hebrew words. But that particular word is hesed. Now, that, that word, a better way to say it is a steadfast, unrelenting, unfailing love. So kindness, not really the right word. And even love is not a big enough word for it. It's an unrelenting, unfailing, steadfast love is what he's saying. Is there anybody that's related to King Saul who's still alive that, I, should, that I, I want to show them unrelenting, unfailing love. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? See, the history of the Israelite people is this, to, get you, to help you understand the, the weight of this word. God blesses them, they turn their back on him, and then he shows said to them. He shows them his unfailing love. He never leaves them and keeps pursuing them. David is asking, is there anybody in the family of Saul still alive that I can show grace to, is what he's saying. Now, why would he do that? The passage actually tells us this. If you continue, here's the full question. Here's what he asks. Is there anyone, anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? That's the full question. So is there anybody still alive, King Saul's family? I want to show his said, I want to show them grace, unfailing love for Jonathan's sake. Because David's remembering that he made a promise to Jonathan. Do you remember it? 1 Samuel 20, you guys remember that? We just talked about it. How was he able to remember this many, many, many years later? Because David was walking in his purpose. And when you're walking in your purpose, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and you can hear the promises that you've made and hear the promises of God as he's speaking to you. Another thing, not only is David walking in his purpose, he's not hung up on the haters, by the way. Hope you noticed that. And when you're walking in your purpose, you don't get hung up on what haters are trying to say and trying to derail you from what God has called you to do. See, David also in this moment, he remembers there's a guy named Ziba here. He's a servant of Saul. He knows he's still alive. And he knows that if he can find this guy, he would have insider information about the family of Saul. So we see in verse 2, 2 Samuel 9, verse 2, he summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. He says, are you Ziba? The king asked, yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to him, to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of John, Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Pause. I want you to notice, he did not call him by his name. 
He said, there is one alive, and he's crippled. He talked about him, about his condition, not his name. You can almost, if you read this, you can almost hear Ziba saying, yes, king, there is somebody who's still alive, but he won't fit in. You don't want him in your palace. You don't want him to come in here because he can't even walk. It won't look good for you, king, if you let him come in here. And see, in 2 Samuel chapter 4, if we go back a little bit, you'll learn that his name is Mephibosheth. And the name Mephibosheth literally means shame. So if you're looking for a name to name your next child, not a good Bible name to pick. I'm just saying. So we learn about how this even came about when he was named and how he got the name in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. Now, the question you'd ask yourself is why was she running with him? Again, we already said it earlier. She found out that Saul and Jonathan had been killed. And everybody would have known. The king is dead. The new king is going to come in. And he's going to wipe out the entire family. So she's trying to run and hide this heir, this son of Jonathan. But she drops him. And he is crippled. David asks, we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. After he, he, he has heard, yeah, there is a son. He's crippled in both feet. David asks, where is he? Now pause. He says, where is he? Not what is he. Where is he? He is so focused on a promise that he had made to Jonathan, and he's going to keep it. See, like Mephibosheth, he has, he has been defined up to this point in his life by his condition. And David doesn't see his condition. He just sees the promise. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Mekir, son of Emil. Now, interesting Lodabar. Lodabar literally means no pasture. Okay? So this is kind of a wasteland. It's not good land. It's not a good place to live. Okay? So there's, it's interesting that, that Mephibosheth would be living in a place called Lodabar. Why would he be why would he choose to live in a place called Lodabar? Why would he live there? Well, there's only really two reasons why you'd live in a place like Lodabar. Number one, if you had nowhere else to go, you had no other options. Or if you didn't want to be found. You had nowhere else to go, or you didn't want to be discovered. You had nowhere else to go, or you wanted to hide from the king because you knew what was coming. Verse 5, so David sent for him and brought him from that particular home, and his name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. Now, pause. Put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. You come up here and try it. <laughs> Mephibosheth's shoes. Put yourself in his particular shoes for a second. He's a descendant of Saul. Remember Saul? He tried to kill David. You know the rules. Get rid of all the descendants. Get rid of all the threats to the throne. And now King David has found you, and he wants you to come to the palace. And you've been hiding. I'm going to be like ABC. I'm out of her. I'll be like in sync. Bye, bye, bye. Like, isn't that, I'm out. He gone. Like, he's gone. Like, I'm out. Like, no. How do you think he is feeling about this right now? I'll tell you what he's thinking. He, what he's feeling. He's scared. Is what he's thinking. Verse 6. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mm. The fact that the king called him by name is extremely important right here. He's the only one in this story that called him by name and not his condition first. And see, when you call somebody by their name, you're showing them respect. Verse 6, 
Mephibosheth, he replied, I am your servant. Verse 7. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show you kindness because of the promise I made to your father, Jonathan. Now here's, I want you to see what's getting ready to happen here. Mephibosheth is about to receive grace because of what someone else did on his behalf. I'm going to say that again. Mephibosheth is about to receive grace because of what somebody else did on his behalf. And in this particular moment, even just mercy would have been a miracle for him. But what he gets, he's getting ready to hear is going to be unheard of. Verse 7. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul. What? See, mercy is one thing. Mercy is you deserve some type of punishment. And someone's saying, you're not going to get that punishment. And it could just be a postponement of the punishment. You might end up still getting it somehow, or maybe they'll lessen the punishment. But there's mercy nonetheless. Forgiveness is another thing. It's saying you're not, you, it's, it, the debt is forgiven. Like you don't have to pay it back anymore. But see, grace is a whole other world. Grace is mercy and forgiveness and then blessing on top of it. And you can't even pay back the blessing. That's what grace is. And that's what he's being shown right now. And by the way, this land, when he's giving back land to him, what David is doing is making him immediately wealthy. Very, very, very wealthy. Not only that, but he's restoring his identity by giving him land. You know why? Because the land that he's giving him is in the promised land. And the Israelites knew if you had land in the promised land, it meant that you were in the family of God. It's a big deal. That's grace. David is is saying this to him. I understand how people see you, but let me give you God's perspective. You are a child of God. Oh, but wait, it gets better. It gets better. Verse 7. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. Okay, wait a minute. Normally, you would come and kill me. You would call me in and you'd kill me. You're not going to kill me. You want to show me, has said, like you're going to show me the grace. You're going to give me land, and then I get to hang out in the palace and have Lamberts, like whenever I want it, like that's what I'm going to. You all have to understand that when you eat at somebody's table, it's a very high honor. Especially the king's table. This is the king. The best of the best, right? He's from Lodabar. Y'all, they didn't have no J's in Lodabar. Come on. Verse 8. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you would show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Let me translate to you what he's saying. He's saying, King David, you don't know who I am. Another question. How many of you have dogs? Anybody got some dogs up in here? Oh, man, a lot of y'all have dogs. Okay. How many of you really like your dogs? Right? Okay. That's good. Um, just a newsflash, when you see him talking about dogs and you look in the Old Testament and they talk about dogs, back then a dog wasn't what you think they are today, okay? They were a nuisance. People didn't like them, right? So not only is he saying, I'm a dog, I'm a dead dog, okay? So it's like a different degree of bad. So Mephibosheth, he's basically saying, um, most people would probably be happy if I was just dead, if you understand what I'm saying, King David. That's my life. I'm worthless. I have nothing to offer. You should just kill me. And you're giving me what? The story ends like this. 2 Samuel 9, verse 13. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you three things from this particular story that I think is so important. If you want to pursue God, I think we can learn three amazing, amazing points, principles, and truths seen through David. The first one is this. David pursued someone to help just like God pursues us. David pursued someone to help just like God pursues us. 2 Samuel 9, 13 again, and Mephibosheth who was crippled in both feet, lived in where? 
Well, I thought he was in Lodabar. Oh, he was in Lodabar. But then the king pursued him, called him out of Lodabar, and now he's at the king's table. You understand that? See, you may be in a broken situation this morning, but the king of the universe has a plan to come into your situation and move you from your Lodabar to Jerusalem. He's pursuing you to show you kindness, to show you goodness, to show you he has a plan for you, a good plan for you, to prosper you, to bless you, for freedom. And there's nothing that you can do to stop God. He has a tracking device on you. Hope you know that. You can run, but you can't hide from God. And see, the thing is, if you don't understand grace, if you don't understand the undeserved kindness, the undeserved love and forgiveness and favor of God, what will happen is if you don't understand grace, you're going to think that you've got to earn his love. See, listen, even when you stop, he doesn't stop pursuing you. Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, no, no, listen, y'all, I have a plan and a purpose for you. A plan to prosper you. I, I got a really, really, really good plan. See, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that God has a plan for you and that he is pursuing you, you will want to stay in your Lodabar. You will want to stay in your place of embarrassment. You will want to stay in your place of defeat. You want to stay in your place of lack. But guess what? The king of kings <laughs> is looking for you in that place. He will come to you in your Lodabar to take you out of the Lodabar. The question is, are you ready to come out of your Lodabar today? <laughs> He's ready there. He, he, is, he is pursuing you. The second thing, David was not ashamed of him, just like God is not ashamed of us. David was not ashamed, just like God's not ashamed of you. 2 Samuel 9, 13, and Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. Now, remember, I'm going to go back a little bit. The king asked him, is there anybody still living in Saul's family? If so, I want to show him kindness. Zeba replied, yeah, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Now, I want you to understand, what did, what, y'all remember, what did David say after Zeba said this? I'll tell you what he didn't say. He didn't say, how crippled is he? He didn't say, how damaged is he? He didn't say, how low has he gotten? He didn't say, how poor is he? He didn't say, oh, is he still drinking? He didn't say, oh, is he still smoking? He didn't say, oh, is he an outcast that will embarrass me if I bring him in here? Nope, didn't say that. He said, where is he? I want to know where he's at because I want him here. Because I don't care what his condition is. I have a promise, and I plan to fulfill that promise. Someone in here needs to hear this today. God is not put off by the place you're in. God's not. You know what, pause a minute. I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to go here for a second. I know there's some religious people going to, say, going to sit here and go, oh, here we go. He's going to start talking about forgiveness. And we already heard that. And it's going to tell people, that, basically, he's going to tell them they can keep on sinning, you know, whatever. Like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Not what I'm saying. Not what I'm saying. The problem when you get a religious heart is you forget where you used to be before God came and saved you. That's the problem. So if you got a religious spirit in here today... I suggest you go back to the place where you were crippled, when you were damaged, when you were down, when you were low, and God came in and pulled you out of your load of bar. Have you forgot when you and your load of bar, when God came and saved you? Have you forgot about that? Every now and then it's good to go back to that place. When I was in that load of bar, and look, now I'm in Jerusalem. So when you see somebody else in their load of bar, I can connect with them, and my job is not to leave them there, but to help them and be with them, right? See, God's not repelled by where you're at. <laughs> He's not ashamed. He wants to anoint you and appoint you. He's not repelled. He wants you to repent. It's just like this. 
Some of you in here today, now if you're the person who's been running from God, no matter what, if you've been, if you've been running from him because you've got pride or you're running from him because you're a rebel, whatever it is you've been running, if you've been running from God, if you've been, if you've been running from somebody before, if somebody's been there to try to chase you before, like when you're a little kid, somebody chased you and you're running and you run and you're running and they're right behind you and you stop, what happens when you turn around? They're right there, right? And that's the way it is when you're running from God. You're running, you're running, you're running, you're running, and if you'll just stop and turn around, he is right there to meet you and to love you and put you in his arms if you'll just stop running. See, the enemy is lying about your Lodabar place. Oh, there's no way out. There's no solution. There's no answer to your problem. And you might be thinking, well, I've been doing this so long. I've been hiding what I've been doing for so long. I've got this greed in my heart, jealousy in my heart, anger in my heart, guilt in my heart. I've been doing it for so long. I'm so accustomed to this Lodabar place. And God is saying, I will not leave you in your Lodabar. I will meet you there and I won't leave you there. I'll walk you out of Lodabar into Jerusalem. Let me ask you a quick question before I move on. Do you happen to have somebody in your circle, it could be a friend or a coworker or somebody or a family member, that you're ashamed of? Do you have somebody that God has put in your circle that you're ashamed of them because they're in a Lodabar place right now? As I believe, if they're in your circle of influence, God has placed them there for you to help them walk with them witness to them, share the Hesed love of God with them out of their Lodabar into Jerusalem. Do you understand that Mephibosheth, he needed help to get to the king. He's crippled. He needed help to get there. People were there to help him get to the king. We all, at one point when you were in your Lodabar place, you needed help to get to Jesus. We all need help. If it wasn't for other believers who spoke into my life when I was in my Lodabar place, I would not be standing here today in front of you. I guarantee it. I would still be lost. A sinner, so lost, so lost, so blind. But somebody came in my Lodabar place, invested time with me. Even when I didn't want to hear it, they came into my Lodabar place. But they knew God had a plan and purpose for my life. I bet they didn't see this. But they knew God had more. And they were being obedient. And some of you today, there's somebody around you in a Lodabar place. And you are the one who's supposed to speak into their life. You are the one who's supposed to speak into their their life right now. You're supposed to go into their Lodabar place. You're supposed to go there. Don't go, well, I'll just wait and see if pastor will show up. You go. They need help. Why do you all think we have life groups? To have another program? To have another thing to manage here? We don't need another thing to manage, believe me. I'm busy as it is. We have life groups. So when you're in your low to bar place, there are people on the mountaintop that can pull you up. And then when they get down in a load of bar place, you can pull them up. That's why we have life groups, to do life together. I don't care how saved you are. You are going to have valley times and valley seasons in your life. Stop acting like you don't have them. Stop living in Facebook fantasy world, right? It's not all good all the time, right? God is good all the time. But this world is a broken place, and the devil works through people, and it can be hard. That's why we need to be in life groups. We need to be in circles, lifting each other up, praying for each other. And if you're not in a life group, you need to go up there and sign up for a life group today. I'm telling you. Yes, I just snuck a plug in there, but I did it on purpose because I love you. You need to be in a life group, every single one of you. Okay. Even if you're in a mountaintop moment right now, 
In fact, if, you're, if, you're, if everything's, you know, flowers and roses, someone really needs you in that life group right now, right? The third thing is this. David redeemed and restored him. God does the same for us. 2 Samuel 9, 13, again, Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem, and he ate, how often? Regularly at the king's table. Was it just a one-time dinner appointment? Was it just for a photo opportunity so we could put it on Facebook? Just for the standard Democrat real quick? We just get a quick picture? Is that, is that what happened right there? Nope. Regularly. How? How? David redeemed and restored him. See, people were only referring to him based on his condition and his location. People, listen, will try to label you by what damaged you. Oh, that's the girl who did this. That's the woman who did that. That's the guy who did that. Y'all remember that? Remember what they did? They're from over there. They're not from over here, right? But see, God has given you a new name if you're in Christ. See, if you're in Christ, not only do you have a new name, you have a new identity. And it's by the power of his blood that he's washed you clean and made you new. He's given you new breath in your lungs, and he's made you brand new. See, when you're in Christ, you don't have to answer to the name, oh, I'm an addict. When you're in Christ, you don't have to answer to, oh, I'm a religious person. See, when you're in Christ, you don't have to answer that I'm damaged goods. When you're in Christ, you don't have to answer to the label, oh, you're a screw-up. You don't have to answer to that anymore. See, people might call you those things. Listen, people might call you these negative labels. Somebody might call you damaged. Somebody might call you worthless. Somebody might call you no good. People might call you these labels. You have to stop answering to them. Stop answering to what God hasn't called you. And you see this story of David and Mephibosheth. It's a bigger story of grace. That's the story. God's grace towards his children. God's grace towards you. God's grace towards me. But we're totally, absolutely, 100% unworthy to sit at the king's table. Just like he was. We're unworthy of his kindness. We're unworthy of his mercy. We're unworthy of his forgiveness. We're unworthy of his provision. We're unworthy of his love. We're unworthy of his grace. And what many of us fail to see is that we are Mephibosheth. We are. But then we have 1 John 3, 1. See how very much our Father loves us. For he has called us, no matter our condition, no matter what your location is, he has called us his children. And that is what we are. We are his children. You are his child. If you're in Christ. And you see Mephibosheth, he's in this position of grace because of what his father, Jonathan, did for him. But let me tell you this. Jesus is a better Jonathan. He is. I want you to picture this for a moment. We're in the palace. King David. You walk in, you're just kind of getting to observe like a fly on the wall. Wouldn't that be cool to watch dinner? You see his mighty men walk in, King David's mighty men. And these dudes were bad dudes. Big, strong, scary, very much like me. Like they're very, so I, I represent that in the story for your visual, okay? But can you imagine them coming in? They're dirty, they're dusty, they've got their swords, they probably got to throw them off to the side. And they sit down, they're probably a little stinky, right? They're probably a little smelly. Maybe have a little blood stain on them. They walk in and sit down. Wow, that's the mighty men. There's Absalom, Tamar. Like, whoa, royalty is in here. This is crazy. And then you hear that noise of crutches coming in.
He probably gets some help. Sit at the table. Ephiba Seth sits down and he's like, Sorry, I was a little late, y'all. What's to eat tonight? I'm hungry. And what some people might look at as someone who shouldn't be at the table, the king has invited him in to sit down and eat. The crazy thing is you're invited to a better table than that. God's dinner table. I can't imagine what it's going to be like one day. Walk in that room, the dining room. Be a gray-haired guy standing there. He's going, ha, 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 hi, 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 hi. My, 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 my name is Moses. Wow, there's Moses. There's Abraham and Isaac sitting over there. Wow. Oh, there's, there's King David right over there. That's amazing. Wow. Right, there's the disciples. Wow. Where's Paul? Paul. Oh. Y'all, I'm going to die when I get to see Paul. It's going to blow me away. But the thing is, you have a spot at the exact same table as all of them. And I feel like some of you in this room today, you don't believe that. You don't believe that. You look at that empty seat over there, and you think it's for somebody else who's better than you, smarter than you, more religious than you, has more gold stars from Bible school than you had. (laughs) <laughs> Jesus was very, very clear, y'all. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the only one, there's only one way, it's Jesus. He gave his only son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but they will have everlasting life. Let me translate that. A seat at the table, if you believe. So my question to you this morning, do you believe? Do you believe you you deserve a seat over here at this table, at God's table? Do you really believe that there is a seat right here with your name? There's There's a little card here with your name on it, reserved for you. At the same table that the disciples and Paul and Moses all sit at, there's a reservation with your name on it if you are in Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Right? Yeah. It's true. And so I just really felt this morning that there's somebody, there's people, I don't know how many of you in here, that you were going to walk in here this morning and you are struggling with that identity. Like you don't really know if, if you're good enough. You feel unworthy. You, you, almost, you really probably feel like you, you haven't done enough. You, you haven't earned your spot on the table. And if that's you this morning, let me correct your thinking and your theology. That's not biblical, okay? All are welcome at the table of the Lord who put their trust in Jesus, right? It has nothing to do with where you're at right now. It has everything to do with where your heart's at right now, right? 